So the title of my talk is Paradigms of Hypertuberculation of the LV Myocardium. And those of you in the audience who are thinking, what does, this, what does this all mean, all will be revealed by the end of this talk. Now, I'm also aware that there are different levels of specialists in the audience. I've designed this talk to cover aspects for everyone. To briefly discuss the cardiac structure in athletes, to give you a background of not, to non-compaction and the criteria used to diagnose the condition, to discuss the dilemmas of increased trabeculation in athletes and the significance of these features, and to finally finish off with the preload hypothesis. Participation in regular ex exercise for at least four hours per week is associated with an increase in left ventricular wall thickness and cavity size. The magnitude with which this occurs is relatively modest in that 15 to 20% get an increase in left ventricular wall thickness, 6 to 10% have an increase in left ventricular cavity size, and this results in a 40 to 50% increase in right ventricular mass. We also now know that athletes get, a, get an increase in the right ventricular cavity size. You've already seen this slide, but some of our athletes have very large dimensions in that 2% of our athletes get an in, exceed the left ventricular wall thickness of more than 13 millimeters in a range consistent with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and 14% of our athletes have LV cavities of more than 60 millimeters in a range consistent with dilated cardiomyopathy. This data has already been presented by Dr. Zaidi, but to keep it very brief, with the right ventricle, 30 to 40 percent of our athletes get big right ventricular cavities, fulfilling the ARVC criteria. And in cardiology, I mean, we're used to assessing wall thickness, left and right ventricular cavity size, and we're also used to seeing the smooth cardiac contours of the ventricular myocardium, as demonstrated in the cartoon diagram as well. But over the past 20 years or so, there have been significant advances in echocardiographic resolution that have brought more detailed attention to the myocardial structure. And we see images like these. This is an example of an athlete demonstrating increased trabeculation separated by these intratrabecular recesses. And this type of morphology raises the prospect of left ventricular non-compaction. Left ventricular non-compaction is a novel cardiomyopathy characterized by these prominent trabeculations separated by the intertrabecular recesses that communicate with the left ventricular cavity. There are a few pathoanatomical correlations between the imaging anomalies we see and actual cardiac structure. And on histology, we identify a two-layered structure with an outer compacted layer and an inner non-compacted layer comprising of trabeculations and recesses. The etiology of left ventricular non-compaction is thought to be due to an abnormal myocardial morphogenesis. In the embryo, the heart starts off as a meshwork of, of fibers, and as the blood supply develops, uh, the trabeculations regress and form a smooth, compacted um, layer of the left ventricle. In some individuals, particularly those who are exposed to high pressure overload, due to congenital abnormalities, there is an arrest of myocardial morphogenesis and the trabeculations persist. This phenomenon is common in the pediatric population. It's well established and associated with congenital abnormalities. But there have been increasing reports in adults where uh, we identify these features in the absence of congenital abnormalities, and it's been termed isolated left ventricular non-compaction. Non-compaction is associated with progressive systolic heart failure, a predisposition to fatal arrhythmias, and the risk of systemic thromboembolic events. There are several facts that suggest it's not a distinct cardiomyopathy. It's genetically heterogeneous. It overlaps with the morphological manifestations of several distinct cardiomyopathies, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's also part of several metabolic cardiomyopathies and cardiac manifestations of neuromuscular disorders. There are several, there are three main echo diagnostic criteria for non-compaction, those proposed by Chin, Jenny, and Stolberger. And I must say, there are no gold standard at this, at this present time. What they do all have in common is the presence of excessive trabeculations separated by these recesses and the presence of a double-layered myocardial architecture comprising of the outer compacted layer and the inner non-compacted layer. To keep it very brief, the differences between the three criteria are the chin measure a ratio of X to Y, being less than 0.5 in diastole. Jenny measure a ratio in systole of a non-compacted to compacted, being greater than 2. And Stolberger, which is the least specific of all criteria, look for more than three trabeculations distal to the papillary muscle. 
There are also MRI criteria for non-compaction, those proposed by Peterson, who assess a non-compacted to compacted layer of more than 2.3 in long axis views, and Jackie criteria, which are slightly different, that look at trabeculated LV mass of being more than 20% of the global LV mass. There are some concerns regarding the current diagnostic criteria. They were based on small cohorts. They were not prospectively derived. They were not validated properly in patients with cardiomyopathy or those with manifestations of non-compaction. The measurements were performed in different phases of the cardiac cycle. The sites of measurements were, where, were also variable. They're oversensitive in certain populations, particularly the black population, and they're non-specific in low-risk populations, as I will present later. And based on the pediatric population, the prevalence is thought to be less than 0.3%. And this slide shows the non-specific features in various studies. If we take a look at individuals who are referred for echocardiography in a normal hospital, let's take 500 for example, then 2.2% fulfill features of non-compaction. And this prevalence is far greater, than the, uh, far greater than the prevalence of some of the other uh, primary cardiomyopathies presented here today. If we take a look at African and Afro-Caribbean controls from our experience, 8% demonstrate increased trabeculations. Sickle cell anemia and uh, patients with heart failure, these individuals have an increased cardiac preload. And again, they demonstrate a high prevalence of the non-compaction features. These findings suggest that in certain populations or disease processes, increased trabeculations are likely to represent a morphological response to increased loading conditions rather than a specific myocardial disorder, and I will refer to this as an epiphenomenon. So this nicely takes me to the issue in athletes. Athletic training is another situation whereby individuals are exposed to increased pressure, uh, preload and afterload. And we see images, we see images like these. It is, it's possible that the appearance of these trabeculations um, are, are associated with an increased cardiac preload. In, in Europe, athletes are, are subjected to um, pre-participation ECG and echocardiography, and we find increased trabeculations in these individuals raising dilemmas of left ventricular non-compaction. And if you look hard enough, you will identify athletes with the smooth cardiac contours of the ventricular myocardium, shown here, those with increased trabeculations, and those that fulfill the non-compaction criteria. Okay, we're going to break this up a bit, make it more interactive. This is a video of, an, of a basketball player, and I'd like a show of hands whether you think this is a physiological response to exercise, or whether you, you think it's non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Um, I, I, he's a black basketball player. Okay, I think you've seen now. Hands up for physiology. <laughs> Hands up for non-compaction. I think my job's already done. <laughs> okay, I want to share our experience of increased trabeculation in athletes. We looked at over 1,100 athletes competing at regional, national, and international level. All underwent pre-participation ECG and echocardiography. The mean age of the athletes was 20 years, 80% were male, 80% were Caucasian, and we compared our athletes to 415 controls, which we recruited from the CRI, CRI population screening program, and we also compared them with 75 patients with left ventricular non-compaction. We defined increased trabeculations based on our sedentary control population, measured the mean number of trabeculations, and took a value two standard deviations above this, and this amounted to a figure of three trabeculations. And this is in keeping with pre previously proposed criteria. We also use the CHIN and the Jenny criteria for non-compaction because they have been validated, although in, in smaller cohorts. And this is what we found. When we just looked at trabeculations in our athletes, our athletes had greater trabeculations compared to controls. Almost one-fifth of our athletes had increased trabeculations. There were no sex differences, around one in five, black, uh, one in five male athlete and a one in five female athlete had increased trabeculations. 
And trabeculations were more common in black athletes compared with Caucasian athletes. Around one in three black athletes had a trabeculated myocardium compared to one in five ca uh, Caucasian athletes. What about the non-compaction criteria? 8.1% of our athletes fulfilled both the Chin and the Jenny criterion for non-compaction, and this comprised of 11% of black athletes and 8.4% of Caucasian athletes. In contrast, none of our controls fulfilled the non-compaction features. The fact that one in 10 athletes fulfills this criteria should make you think of an epiphenomenon rather than a disease process. When we compared our athletes fulfilling the criteria to those that didn't, there was no age, sex, or ethnic predilection. There's no differences in body size or hours of training. There were no differences in echocardiographic parameters, including diastology. However, there was a higher prevalence of T-wave inversion in athletes fulfilling the criteria compared to those that didn't. When we compared our athletes uh, fulfilling the criteria, to patients with non-compaction cardiomyopathy, then two-thirds of the non-compaction patients had symptoms compared to none of our athletes. Uh, patients with non-compaction, uh, the majority of those individuals had T-wave inversion in the infralateral leads. Patients with non-compaction also had uh, reduced systolic function uh, with a mean of 46% and also reduced longitudinal systolic function compared to our athletes. However, this slide is slightly worrying. Around 1% of our athletes fulfilling the criteria for non-compaction also demonstrated uh, repolarization changes on their ECGs and reduced systolic function. And this gray zone comprised of 3.4% of black athletes and 0.5% of Caucasian athletes. And I have to say, this gray zone is still smaller than some of uh, the gray zone for some of the other cardiomyopathies that has been presented here today. Now, this table is busy, and I don't want you to focus on it too much. There are three points to take away. When we looked at the 10 athletes in that gray zone, point one, 80% of these athletes had T-wave inversion in V1 to V3. Point two, the rejection fractions ranged between 46 to 50 percent, but never less than 46 percent. And point three, the indices of diastolic function were all normal. And this is a typical, typical example of an athlete in the gray zone who demonstrates T-wave inversion in the inferior leads, fulfills um, the non-compaction criteria, and exhibits uh, slightly reduced systolic function. We also performed MRIs in all 10 athletes, all fulfilled the Peterson criteria for non-compaction, as one would expect, and none of, none of the athletes demonstrated fibrosis on late gadolinium enhancement. So the question, ladies and gentlemen, is what is the significance of increased trabeculation in our, in our athletes? Well, our group's view is that one in 10 athletes has increased trabeculations, and this is likely to represent a morphological response to increased cardiac preload. Around 1% of our athletes, uh, specifically those who demonstrated the non-compaction criteria dem uh, and T-wave inversion with reduced systolic function, may have a primary myocardial disorder. If we take a look at the lower arm in more detail, the problem with this study is that it was cross-sectional, so we can't really be sure that exercise led to the development of these trabeculations or caused an exaggeration of pre-existing trabeculations. And one way to test this hypothesis would be to identify indiv individuals with normal cardiac structure or those with some pre-existing trabeculations and subjecting a, an increased cardiac preload and then reassessing their echoes to see if they develop trabeculations and then to check what happens back at baseline. We tested um, hypothesis A. We used a pregnancy model to test this hypothesis and as uh, Prof Sharma uh, told you earlier on, pregnancy is associated with doubling of the blood volume and an increase in cardiac output. So we had our perfect model to test and test this hypothesis. We scanned women in around 12 weeks in the first trimester, uh, allowed time for the preload to have its effect, and then we scanned them in the third trimester, and then scanned them again in the postpartum period when the preload normalized back to baseline. We recruited 102 premigravida pregnant women and only included women with a, a normal left ventricular myocardial architecture. 
And as I said earlier, women underwent echoes in the first, third, and postpartum periods. And the scans were analyzed for left ventricular volumes, trabeculations, and the non-compaction criteria. And this is what we found. Of the 102 pregnant women, 26 developed de novo trabeculations. And eight women who, f who showed sufficient trabeculations fulfilled the non-compaction criteria. And during a follow-up period of 24 months, almost all women showed either complete or almost complete resolution of these trabeculations. Women, these women also had appropriate increase in left ventricular volumes, LV mass, a reduction in their total vascular resistance. And this is an example of a woman who developed trabeculations. You can see at baseline, the smooth cardiac contours. In the third trimester, she develops a spongy myocardium. And as the preload normalizes in the postpartum period, it's back to normal. <coughs> and the results of this study suggest that in the majority of individuals, including our athletic cohorts who had trabeculations, and low-risk individuals in the population, increased trabeculations are likely to represent a benign myocardial response to increased cardiac preload. However, we still have this situation whereby 1% of our athletes fulfilled this triad of non-compaction, reduced systolic function, and T-wave inversion. What about this group? Well, we did test this group extensively. We did uh, stress echoes on them. We did CPETs. We did XI. We did 24-hour uh, halter ECGs. The left ventricular function improved with exercise. They had high peak VO2s. They didn't demonstrate any arrhythmias. And they had appropriate blood pressure response to exercise. And as things stand, there isn't enough data to label these individuals with non-compaction cardiomyopathy. However, there are certain markers, of, there are certain markers favoring pathology over physiology. And we have come up with an algorithm based on our non-compaction patients and our athletic cohorts. And this is what it is. The presence of, a, uh, presence of symptoms and a family history would favor disease. Reduced longitudinal function would be of concern, as would low peak VO2. The failure of the ejection fraction to improve on exercise and the observation of frequent arrhythmias during exercise would be of concern. Strain patterns are still in the experimental phase, but if you had an abnormal myocardial strain or paradoxical systolic loop, that would suggest a primary myocardial disorder. The presence of late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI, and we should go out of our way to assess first degree relatives to determine familial inheritance patterns. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the diagnostic criteria for non compaction are based on small cohorts and haven't been validated properly. They lack specificity in many. Almost 10% of our athletes uh, reveal the non compaction criteria, suggesting that we, didn't, we need more specific criteria. Around 1% of our athletes fulfilled the triad. And we need multi-center studies, longitudinal follow-up, and familial assessment uh, to understand the significance of these observations. I'd like to thank CRI for all the support they've given me to make this research possible. I'd like to also thank Prof Sharma for being the best supervisor I've ever come across. And I'd also like to thank the pregnant women who took part in this study. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues at Lewisham who've helped me with, with my echoes and at St. George's and Dr. Papadakis as well. Um, if there's anything you're going to remember, please remember my Twitter account. <laughs>